Hello, everyone. I'm Miami Book Fair Programs Manager, Paula Fernandez Rana, and I want to welcome you all to Miami Book Fair 2020, the first online Miami Book Fair in our 36 year history. We are grateful to be part of Miami Day College, a community college serving South Florida for more than 50 years. On behalf of the MDC Board of Trustees, the entire college family, and the staff, advisory committees, and supporters and sponsors of the Miami Book Fair, we wish you the very best and hope you enjoyed this program and all the others we are presenting at this fair. Tonight we have Words Whispered in Water, Why the Levees Broke in Hurricane Katrina. It documents activist Sandy Rosenthal's battle to find the culprits in the catastrophic flooding of New Orleans and unravel the cover-up that took to protect them. She is the founder of the grassroots organization, levies.org. She will be in conversation with NPR's John Burnett. He is a Southwest correspondent based in Austin, Texas, and he covers immigration and border affairs, Texas news and other national assignments. In 2018, and again in 2019, he won the National Edward R. Morrow Award for the Radio Television News Directors Association for continuing coverage on immigration. In December 2018, Burnett was invited to participate in a workshop on refugees and immigration and border security in Western Europe. Tonight, um, please help me welcome John Burnett and Sandy Rosenthal in conversation together. Thank you. Hey, Sandy. Good to see you. Hey, good to see you again, John. So um, the reason we're talking is because in the years after Katrina, uh, which happened in 2005, we met when I was covering the storm and its aftermath uh, fairly in depth. And you were a terrific source of hard hitting information on uh, what was going on with the levees and the reporters who were trying to follow the um, uh, the disaster that was um, the levy failure, we all turned to you. And now you have this very impressive book, um, Words Whispered in Water, that um, I finished last night. And so we're going to talk about that. Wonderful. Good. Um, so take us back to August of 2005. Uh, you're, you're sort of a, you know, an armchair hydrologist and a levy expert now. But back then, with this epic storm that filled up the entire Gulf of Mexico, was roaring toward New Orleans. And what were you thinking about your home and about the levees were supposed, that were supposed to protect the below sea level New Orleans? Keep in mind that exactly one year earlier, we had all had to evacuate the city of New Orleans for Hurricane Ivan. And that was a disaster because the, the, um, the mechanism for getting traffic out of the city wasn't perfected yet. So we were prepared for a gridlock. We were prepared for being in traffic for hours and hours, um, maybe 12 hours or more. So that was really more on our minds than the idea of flooding, because after all, we're protected by these wonderful levees built by the Army Corps of Engineers. So no, that was our concern. How do we get out and how do we get out uh, quickly? And you believe that this um, very sophisticated, uh, extensive series of levy would protect New Orleans um, the way it mostly had in the many years leading up to Katrina. Well, well, yes, we, we knew that there, there could possibly be some overtopping water going over the tops of some levees, but we call that inconvenient around here. No, our concerns were um, first responders, you know, firemen, doctors, uh, electricity, air conditioning. We didn't expect to have any of those things for three weeks to a month. And so I packed for three weeks and, and my family did and, and we got the heck out of here. Nobody had ever uh, thought of levees breaching and there was no, um, even, even, the, even the most desperate calls from our elected officials to get out of town did not say anything about levee breaches. Right. So you joined the exodus of tens of thousands of New Orleanians who fled to um, surrounding cities. And when did you realize that New Orleans was sinking in the floodwaters, that the great deluge that everyone had feared had arrived? 
not until Tuesday. Hurricane uh, Katrina's eye crossed into Louisiana in the wee hours of the morning on Monday, and it wasn't until Tuesday, more than 24 hours later, that the first reports leaked out that, no pun intended, that the levees had breached. Uh, in my book, I document that the, the, the responsibility for uh, a vacuum of communication and living in a black hole belongs squarely uh, at the feet of FEMA, who failed to bring in a mobile tower in ahead of the storm, ahead of the storm, uh, to, to help first responders. But no, it was uh, much later that we found out the levees had broken. So I was down at the Hilton Riverside at um, the uh, the foot of Poydras Street, right at the Mississippi, when the storm came in and as the city went underwater. And I remember uh, the day after it hit that officials were saying we dodged the bullet, that it jogged east. And so that's what we thought, that there would be some minor flooding, that um, the, so the pumps would get it out of the city before long. Um, and then we were desperately wrong. Uh, I think the times Picky was the first one to report that uh, there were massive uh, breaches. Uh, where did you first get your news? Probably uh, by this time, we first we evacuated to Jackson, Mississippi, and then when the the hurricane, the rest of Hurricane Katrina that was left went right through Jackson, we had to reevacuate again. And by now, I was back in Louisiana, and we received our news on the television set in Lafayette, Louisiana, and I believe it was CNN. I believe. So. When did you first realize that, um, as we say in the news trade, when did your bullshit meter register that you weren't getting a straight story from the uh, Army Corps of Engineers and that something catastrophic had happened that was not supposed to happen? In, in my mind, that bullet, uh, as you called it, that occurred exactly four weeks after the levees broke. And that was when a family member forwarded me some government testimony, the GAO office, the Government Accountability Office testimony before Congress, explaining who was responsible for what regarding our levees. And in a nutshell, it's not complex, that the Army Corps of Engineers is responsible for the design and the construction of the levee protection and the locals are responsible for maintenance. Well, in my mind, if a, if a building fell to the ground, you wouldn't blame the janitor. You would blame the contractor and the designer of, of the building. And in my mind, all the focus was in totally the wrong place. We should be looking to the Army Corps of Engineers. But at that time, uh, responsibility for the levee breaches was being blamed on the storm, the low-lying geography of the city, and on us, the people of New Orleans, we were being blamed for living here. And the corrupt New Orleans levy board, right? And, and the corrupt <laughs> New Orleans levy board. So let's let's step back for, for a minute, Sandy. And you know how? Again, you, I don't think you have a, a background in all these sciences or engineering. But you know, you you were working with your husband, who has an insurance company, right? And how did you? I mean, there's, there was a lot, all these great investigative reporters who'd done all this work. Um, there were, you know, oceanographers and there were hydrologists and uh, all these people who could have ran up a red flag. And in fact, the reporters did. But yeah. how is it that you made yourself into this amazing expert on the levees? How did you come to that? It. it it's a several reasons, but the first and the foremost, the most important one is I was in a relatively secure space when the levees broke. Keep in mind, I, I packed for three weeks. My home didn't flood. My husband's business didn't flood. And I was in a secure spot where I could watch the levee breach event and then watch the response to the event, uh, which, not, which few people had that uh, relative secure space. And I listened and I read and I read and I listened. And I think my own personal post-traumatic stress syndrome got translated into reading and listening to the radio and reading and watching the TV. So that was reason number one. Reason number two, I think maybe a, a personal character tra trait that I have, when uh -huh. I hear something that doesn't make sense, 
I say, wait a minute. And, and I, don't, I don't care if everybody is telling me I was wrong. If it doesn't make sense and I'm not getting a good answer, I'm not going to accept it. So I think it's mm. a combination of those two factors. Could have been a great reporter, Sandy. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we heard again and again, and I heard this from um, so many officials, uh, federal officials, both FEMA and the Army Corps, that this was a biblical storm. And in fact, it was. It was a Category 5 that drove this monster storm surge uh, up through all of these arteries that then uh, you know, flooded New Orleans uh, and the Mississippi coast, we might add. Uh, the Industrial Canal, the London Avenue, the 17th Street Canal, um, the Gulf Intercoastal Waterway, the Mr. Go. And we heard again and again that there's no way you could prepare for a storm of the century like this. It was going to uh, overtop the levees. It was going to breach the levees. In Mississippi, Hurricane Katrina was a Category 5 storm. In New Orleans, my understanding is by then the winds were down as low as a Category 2. All right, That's, that's item number one. But item number two, I, and I want to point this out, our levees are built by the federal government, the Army Corps of Engineers. Why should we doubt that they should have worked? Why are we, uh, uh, why, um, for example, I'll give you an example. Let's say you're on an interstate highway and you're crossing a bridge. Are you worried the bridge is going to hold? Mm. Of course the bridge is going to hold. We, we don't doubt the bridges. We don't doubt our, our airplanes that we get into. But for some reason, the story was being told that you can't trust a levy built by the Army Corps of Engineers, the federal government. This is the same organization, the Corps, that built tens of thousands of miles along the Mississippi, Missouri, and Ohio rivers, capable of withstanding surge heights of 20 feet or more for 30 days every single year. This is the Army Corps of Engineers, the gold standard and yet all their levees broke. So it's a real big disconnect here. And I think that's part of the reason that many people, including people here in New Orleans, had trouble believing how could this possibly be the Army Corps of Engineers? How could this be possible? But it was. Okay. But my question is, did every single levee and flood wall that breached, mm -hmm. was it were the, were the stewards of that, the Army Corps of Engineers, because we have the Industrial Canal, which divides the uh, Upper Ninth Ward from the, the Lower Ninth Ward, uh, which had uh, probably the most catastrophic flooding of all. And uh, those were flood, those are cement flood walls. Was the Army Corps responsible for those that breached and shot water out like a cannon that swept houses off their foundations? The answer is yes, yes, and yes. There were 52 breaches in the city of New Orleans. Levees breach for different reasons in different parts of the city. For example, in eastern New Orleans, the reason the levees breached was because levees, instead of being full of good, thick Louisiana clay, they were full of sand, erodible mm -hmm. materials, and they melted. That's eastern New Orleans. In the Lower Ninth Ward, the reason for the flooding there is a combination of the, the Mr. Go, a, a navigation channel that is now mm -hmm. closed and the industrial canal, which was uh, sheet pilings that were too short. In the uh, main basin of the city with the most people, property, and infrastructure, the, the, uh, the breach event or the mechanism of, uh, without getting too deep into yeah. the weeds was sheet pilings were too short. It was a design flaw. So in Eastern New Orleans, a design and construction flaw. In the main basin of the city, it was design flaw. But for all of those, the Army Corps of Engineers is the designer, the contractor and the architect. So describe the cover-up uh, that you say happened um, as all this was finally coming to light. In the immediate weeks, days, weeks, and months, and years after the flooding of New Orleans, the Army Corps of Engineers told a story to the American public and to Congress that responsibility for the flooding belonged to the storm, the geography of the city, and, and our personalities. We're all party mm -hmm. people that elected corrupt officials. Uh, the, the Army Corps of Engineers maintained that 
uh, campaign for a full eight months up until the first levy study was published. The Army Corps of Engineers refused to answer questions from Congress until the levy, study, levy studies were complete. Keep in mind that's eight months. Eight months is a long time for the American people to wait. And it was during this time that all those fairy tales took flight. And those are the hardest ones to dismantle because those are the first ones that got into the minds of the American people. Right. So, and what, what the book festival uh, viewers need to know is that you created a website called levies.org, which uh, became uh, the go-to place for accurate information and for breaking information. Um, and it, it really became very influential. Uh, you even had uh, uh, John Goodman and Harry Shearer, a couple of uh, uh, local uh, celebrities uh, doing PSAs for you. And, uh, levies, levies.org um, was a big deal. Well, well, uh, keep in mind there was a vacuum of leadership. You know, thank you, thank you. But there was a vacuum of leadership going on in the city at that time. Uh, the we were on our backs, we, we, not on our knees, on our backs. Yeah. And, and uh, in my, that relative space of security that I spoke about earlier, I was able to step into that void of leadership and 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 take. Uh, and, and take control of that opportunity or uh, exploit that opportunity. And the reason I did it is because everybody I know suffered in, in some way, some people more than others, some people different from others, but we all suffered. So did you ever have some vindication that, when, did the Army Corps ever acknowledge that, yeah, we really screwed up and we're gonna do better next time? It's my understanding that the Army Corps of Engineers, because they're a military organization, cannot criticize a leader because that would be uh, similar to bayoneting the wounded. So the Army Corps of Engineers will never admit they've made a mistake. Hmm. But one thing they will do and did do in their investigation of the levy breaches is they did acknowledge design flaws uh, in in their levies. In, in fact, uh, with the, the pressure and the and the spotlight that we were constantly putting the Army Corps of Engineers, we think that and we think that that resulted in actually a very good final report. However, the Army mm -hmm. Corps of Engineers did not use words like that when speaking to Congress or when speaking to our nation's leaders. Uh, they uh, they they kept it deep in clinical reports that you had to be really had to be uh, a, a little bit of a. Um, Mm -hmm. um, of compulsive like I was at the time. Again, I think that's how I channeled my, my yeah. stress uh, to find these actual admissions of design flaw. So the forensics were there mm -hmm. that they saw that these, um, uh, the structure of the, of the levees were just unsuited to this, um, uh, to this storm. Uh, if you knew how to, uh, to read their language and well, so, yeah. Yes, and the final report did not come out until 2009. This mm. is well past the time where the American people are paying any attention to the people of New Orleans and what they yeah. went. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I wondered as I was reading this, uh, Sandy, you know, I covered the, the 10th anniversary and, and you and I spoke uh, a, a few weeks ago in the 15th anniversary. Um, why did you wait so long to write this book? Much of the information I didn't find until years later. Uh, uh, much of the information that, uh, much of the footnotes of the 500 footnotes in here, I didn't even get them uh, until years later from the Army Corps of Engineers in yeah. request under the Freedom of Information Act. And then finally, I didn't know how the book was going to end until uh, 2010. Although I did start writing in, um, I mean, excuse me, until 2015. That's when I knew how the book would end. I started writing in 2013. It, 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 it couldn't have been written earlier. I, okay. I didn't have the information. I couldn't. Like a good historian, you got to wait. Yeah. <laughs> Journalists are always impatient. So. <laughs> yeah, true. Very true. Yeah. Not talking mm. about you, of course. That's right. So um, when I think of the work that you did, I'm reminded of the uh, the movie in 2000 with Julia Roberts, Erin Brockovich, and how she went from a law clerk to um, uh, a challenging uh, a big electric utility in California for poisoning its citizens. Um, 
What have you learned about the power of a private citizen um, in this democracy that we live in, under assault as it is, um, a power of a private citizen to make a difference? Okay. Um, on the subject of uh, Ms. Blakovich, what I love about her story and what's similar to mine is she and I, neither of us had any particular uh, training any particular background, any particular degrees uh, that, that could help us with what we did. We just yeah. saw the problem and then we went after it. So, so in many ways, our stories are very similar. With regard to the power of a person, it's certainly alive and well. Uh, I have seen so many times in the past 15 years just by asking a question or sending an email or making a phone call or, or just showing up somewhere. Yeah. Showing that, up. Yeah that that alone had the power to make a difference. Uh, the, I, I might add that you may not know it that day, but then you will find out down the road that it, that it did make a difference. So if I, I wish now if someone had told me to leave more paper trails because those paper trails are, are really what, what uh, revolutions are built on. Yeah. And who were the fellow travelers that you met in the, this process of... Um, of uh, of revealing uh you know peeling back the layers of the onion uh who who and who remain your friends uh, to this day who sort of joined your crusade um that list is actually quite long one yeah. of the, one of the good things about the levy breach event which changed america as we know it uh was i met so many wonderful people and uh the first that comes to mind is mr ken mccarthy who showed me all kinds of either cheap or free uh, or very inexpensive ways to get the message out using the internet. Uh, I had an attorney um, uh, at, um, with Adams and Reese, his name is Mark Serpinant, who remains with me to this day, providing legal advice should I need it. Uh, Sharon Bursky, uh provided uh, pu pu publicist advice, you know, how to write a press release. She, she, yeah showed me how to do those things. And then most importantly, number one is Mr. H.J. Bosworth, who is a civil engineer who I, I could not have done this work without him advising me on what the difference is between a T-wall and an I-wall and many other things. And it was your son who was what, in high school, who gave you advice about uh, how, to, how, to, how to get online? Right, well, he's not a friend, he's my son, but yeah, he, he probably, he is the most important of all because he had just turned 15 yeah. when he evacuated for Hurricane Katrina. And, and at, at first, I, when I realized that, that something needed to be done about the misinformation in the country, at, at first, I didn't want to do it. At first, I tried to find someone else who was already doing this work that I could join them. I mean, who wants to lead an effort? I mean, that's a lot yeah. of work. Uh, but after looking for a week, I realized that there wasn't anyone doing that work. And my son said, Mom, if, if you'll write up a mission statement, uh, I'll do a website. And that's how we started. So Hurricane Katrina is one of the most um, expensive, uh, a traumatic, and a fatal natural disasters to ever strike the United States. And it is still the hurricane that all the others are compared to uh, because it was covered by a lot of us who were there. Uh, there were, you know, there was the Galveston storm of 1900 that killed 6,000, but there weren't, wasn't a lot of uh, reporting back then on that. Um, so how much of, of the levy part of the epic Katrina story still occupies your life 15 years later? Is this, have you moved on or is this still a big part of, of who you are, Sandy? It's still a big part of who I am. I am hoping uh, my next goal is to get the uh, one of our properties. Uh, we actually created a museum. It's called the Flooded House Museum. Mm -hmm. We found one of the very last homes flooded uh, during the levee breach event, event right by a breach site, and we converted that into a museum so people can go and see what uh, what it looked like when people got back from um, – from the flood imposed exile. It's not a real flooded home. It's, it's a yeah. of a flooded home. And where, where is that in the city? That is at the breach site of the London Avenue Canal in the Gentilly area of the city. Okay. In that main basin, which is where the most Very people low, are. yeah. Right, and uh, we would like to have that pl placed on the National Register of Historic Places. Mm -hmm. 
I'm I think that's where uh, Dr. Michael White, the famous clarinetist, um, he had a historic collection of clarinets, including one that belonged to the great Sidney Bechet. He had transcriptions of music that he'd done uh, by Jelly Roll Morton. He had a, 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 a f encyclopedic collection of CDs and he had meant to give it to a museum and hadn't gotten around doing it. And it was all ruined. I mean, a lifetime of collections from one of the great figures of traditional jazz. And um, that's just one story of Katrina. That's just one. And he's still playing and he's still brilliant. That's, yeah. that's good. But yes, so, it is a Jen Chili. Yeah. So Sandy, let's talk about the New Orleans of today. Um, Sure. We just had a couple of big scares. Uh, Hurricane Marco uh, fizzled out. Hurricane Laura went east, uh, rather west, and hit uh, Lake Charles. But everybody was pretty freaked out when I was there. Um, I picked up, um, I looked at a, a story in the Scientific American. And uh, we know that the Army Corps of Engineers under um, George W. Bush's uh, order um, really went to work to create a phenomenal flood um, flood protection system for New Orleans to um, to uh, to beef it up. And I saw this thing and, it, you know, it reminds me of, you know, the, what they put up on the Zyder Z to keep the sea out. But here's the headline from the Scientific American. After a 14 billion dollar upgrade, New Orleans levees are sinking. The 14 billion network of love. $14 billion network of levees and flood walls built to protect greater New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina was a seemingly invincible bulwark against flooding. But now, 11 months after the Army Corps completed one of the largest public works projects in world history, the agency says the system will stop providing adequate protection in as little as four years because of rising sea levels and shrinking levees. Uh, that's alarming. And infuriating because there's no need for this headline to have been out there. New levees will subside. They will sink. They, they, they will. They, they're going to. Uh, it's one of the things that engineers who build levees know. So what, what I'm saying is when this new system was built, the designers knew that these, these levees would sink and that new material would need to be put onto them. And so that should have been put into the budget when these levees were built, not let's build the system. Oh, it's it's sinking exactly like we knew they would. Oh, now we need to ask for more money. I mean, imagine asking for more money for anything in this climate. So that's infuriating. But the other thing that's infuriating is the standard with which our levees are being compared. We have something called 100 year protection. That means the levees are designed to withstand, uh, uh, they have a 1% chance of failing uh, in a storm, 1%. That's what 100 year means. It's a, it's a t technical term. However, you will not find one single expert, including myself, who will agree that that is the proper flood protection system for New Orleans with all of our uh, people, property and infrastructure here and our port. 50 percent of every barge in the country comes through this city. So that's that's where we stand now. Is the system better? Yes. Is it way better? Yes. Is it the right system? No. OK, but I, I, let's do give credit where credit is due. Um, this was a phenomenal price tag. Um, the pumping system in Jefferson Parish and in Orleans Parish uh, were improved dramatically. Um, the, the levees were improved. They have enormous um, uh, gates in the water that close to shut down the outflow canals that will uh, shut off other canals that lead into the city, that will even close off a bay out there in St. Bernard Parish. I mean, it's a pretty phenomenal flood protection system. Um, I guess we don't really know whether it's been fully tested yet. And that's that's the scary question mark that um, people in New Orleans have, right? It, it has not been fully tested yet by a Katrina storm. However, right as I mentioned, a Katrina-like storm. But however, as I, as I already mentioned, the system is way, way better than what we had before Hurricane Katrina arrived. So do you do you have any dealings with uh, the Army Corps these days? N lately, not as much. Uh, I used to attend uh, non-governmental organization meetings when they had them. Uh, they don't have those anymore. So my reasons for interacting with them has lessened over the years. Uh, I, I will say that the Army Corps 
um, treats me well now. <laughs> they, 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 their policy of ignoring me did not work. Um, they found out I won't go away. And, uh, and I, I have to admit that um, I have a, uh, a, conge a congenial relationship with them now. But you never got an invitation to their Mardi Gras party. Mm -mm. <laughs> and probably won't. No, they um, have. <laughs> well, let's see. What else? What do you want to say that I haven't asked about, Sandy? Well, the, the only thing that I, can, that I can think of to add is um, when I wrote this book, I really felt that the people of this nation needed to understand why New Orleans flooded because I knew, knew and I understood. I couldn't blame people for feeling that it must be our fault. I didn't blame them for that. So the book was my opportunity, my chance to set the record straight on why New Orleans flooded. And I hope to uh, inspire others who may see a problem in their community, in their state, or even their country and try to fix it. But what I'm still having trouble wrapping my head around is almost every person who's read my book has told me they couldn't put it down. They, mm. they thought it was a page turner. In fact, one of, one of my favorites is, it reads like a Grisham novel on a Pensacola beach in the summer. That's my favorite. And I'm really surprised to hear that because one, I'm not a writer, and two, there's 500 footnotes in this. But that, but I'm, but I'm, I'm warmed by that. And um, what, uh, what are you going to turn your? Are you, have you been invited uh, as as a citizen activist um, to talk to to other groups around the country to inspire them? Yes, I have. I, I was an invited guest of the Levy Breach uh, District, uh, excuse, excuse me, of the Levy District in, <laughs> Cal in California. Um, the, the district escaped me at the moment, but, but it was one of the first districts in California to experience uh, a, a COVID uh, in this past mm -hmm. uh, March. Uh, March, that's right. And so that never materialized, of course. And, and now we have to go, and now everything's by, by Zoom, via Zoom. But yes, yes, I have been um, getting invitations. Um, one, uh, Fort Bend, Houston, uh, one of the levy district managers there asked me for a copy of a map that our organization created um, yeah. for their district. And keep in mind, we are a true grassroots group with with no income stream and no no stake no um money coming from stakeholders uh we are true grassroots group so the fact yeah. that we that we got asked for our map that that's quite a vote of confidence we can't um we can't end a uh a book festival talk without me asking you to read a, a passage from your book um uh, okay. why don't you pick one it could even be that great family that you followed uh uh, who, I mean, yeah, who said, I think they were in um, Lake Lake they were in, uh, uh, Lake Vista, yeah. uh, in 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 the same area. Let me see. Should be pretty easy to find one. The Millers, let me back up just a little bit, okay? If you talk to any survivor of the 2005 flood, most will share a tale of a silver lining, a way in which the survivor's life was improved in some way. For me and my husband, our lives were made better because the 2000 flood put us on a straight and narrow path to Mr. Bullion's doorstep. Our son was no longer in constant pain and the world of sports would soon open up for him. My uh, next, our next door neighbor in Lafayette figured out why my son was in constant pain and, uh, and was able to fix the problem with inserts in his shoes. Um, so that for us was a silver lining. And then right after that, I say the Millers, Harvey and Renee Miller also needed medical care. Their daughter, Beth, continued to worry and urged both of them, especially Harvey, to see a trauma counselor. So th these are two, two separate lives. Uh, one made a little bit better uh, and one, um, the, the, a family that is still in trauma from the levee breaches and still out of this day. Right. Well, Sandy Rosenthal, thank you so much. Um, 
it's a lovely book and uh, a necessary book. And uh, I hope to see you again in your, uh, your beautiful city again sometime. Same here. Thank you, John. You bet.